What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Sacred Giggle Podcast. As always, this is your host, Ashish, a.k.a. Shishi, a.k.a. CC Pants. My guest today is a longtime friend of mine, a brother from another mother, none other than Spencer Zabila. This is technically the intro, so the podcast is going to happen in a second, but Spencer's in the room with me already. It's our first live podcast. And Spencer is one of my best friends in New York. I've known him for almost a decade. And we actually met at the beginning of the 2010s. And we met by throwing parties together as part of a crew called The Breakfast Club, along with our friend Pat, aka Jenga, who has also been a guest on the podcast. And since then, Spencer has gone on to do just so many amazing things. He's a, the true definition of a multi-hyphenate. He started a studio that we're sitting in now called Key and Needle in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and has turned it into an absolute haven for all different types of music. He's an incredibly talented producer who makes house, tech house, techno. And apart from all of that, he's just a really collaborative person who is always looking out for the people around him, always wants everybody around him to win. And that's something that I've always really admired about him. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear this podcast with Spencer, learn a little bit more about his story, and I know you're going to get a lot out of it. So well, let's get into it. <laughs> it's the first time that we are recording the Sacred Giggle podcast live. This is the fourth episode I'm recording. Everything else has been over Zoom. And uh, you live in Brooklyn. I live in Manhattan. So I just came over to your incredible studio, which is like the perfect place to record this. And it's the first time that we're doing this on Instagram Live. So hello, everybody on Instagram Live. So I already introduced you a little bit. But uh, yeah, how are you doing today? What's going on? Good. A little tired. You know, it's been a it's been a crazy day. I had um, Aunt LaRock over earlier and we were making some some house music and talking about the next project that we're working on for our music company, which is basically combining crypto and, and music and giving artists like a leverage with their existing music catalogs, their future potential earnings. So it's been like, you know, a roller coaster. We did a little bit of business, a little bit of creative, and uh, now we're, we're doing a little bit more creative. So that's amazing. Yeah, I feel like that's the perfect description of you as a professional in the music industry. A little bit of business, a little bit of music. And um, yeah, I'm curious. I, you have your hand in a lot of different things, which we'll get to. Like you have your nonprofit. You have this amazing studio that I saw you build from scratch. Like I literally was here when it was just like literally an empty room. And it's pretty remarkable that now it's just like such a professional, amazing studio that we're sitting in. So I saw you build that, but yeah, talk a little bit more about the genesis of this crypto idea and like what inspired you to start that. Well, I mean, it was a lot of, it really happened by accident. The pandemic happened and previous to the pandemic, we were operating as like a commercial studio and that was fine and great. And we did a lot of video production, which was you know, my background was in video production. So I ran a little video production company slowly, but surely that became more of like a utility to do other things and like almost to keep a connection with like, you know, friends that were like doing their artist projects. And we wanted to like help out with the visual side of that. And so the pandemic hit and everything closed down and we weren't able to operate safely in, you know, with people and in the space and it gave us a lot of time to reflect and heal I would say you know because it was like you know in nightlife you know obviously it's like you're hitting the pavement every single day and every single night and you know there isn't a lot of time to just take a break and and relax unless you you know plan for that so there was a lot of thinking there was a lot of thinking involved in what was the next step for Key and Needle. And I kind of wanted to separate myself from the physical space, like use the space less as like a, a revenue generating asset and more of a place, which was my original goal, more of a place to 
create moments naturally and organically without like a price tag attached to it, you know? Easier said than done, you know, because like we all have a, a landlord and we got to pay rent. So figuring that out was difficult. Yeah, it was like a lot of understanding what the market is looking for, what artists are looking for. And I ended up working with this company called, or this foundation called the Web3 Foundation, and they created this network of blockchains called Polkadot and Kusama. They're like two, one is like kind of the wild and crazy cousin of the other, mm-hmm. used for whatever. And I just like learned, I like totally jumped right into crypto and like tried to understand like what it was all about. And this was sort of like in parallel to chilling, you know, in the pandemic and trying to figure out what was going on. And um, I started learning like what people were doing in this space that is sort of becoming coined as hi-fi, which is hybrid finance. And there's this thing called asset tokenization, which is basically the idea behind our company, which is like artists have this asset, which is their music catalog that they own. Sometimes they just own like a percentage of it if they've signed part of it to a label, but they still have an asset. And labels and most people that are unfamiliar with the space will have you believe that that's like not really worth anything or can't generate a yield. and so. We saw people in the crypto space basically minting tokens that were a security for an underlying asset for like silver mines, like unmined silver mines or lithium mines or real estate, you know. And so you understand that like on the macro level, like all of those trends will long term assets will will generate greater value than what they're worth today regardless of the roller coaster in between, but the idea is that everything goes up, right? So we basically said, how can we create that for musicians so that like if you're working on a project, you can borrow money against or create a yield on your future earnings or your current asset, which is like all very dense and complicated, but it's actually not. It just basically means that you have this incredible stored value that everyone pretty much tells you is only able to generate pennies from like Spotify streams. And that's not the case, you know, there's more value in that. And so we're trying to restore faith in the independent artist and, and also, you know, commercial artists as well, but people that basically want more from their music and try and move towards a place where like musicians can like, have whether they're an independent artist or Drake can make more money from what they what they do make it less of a you know a, a creative passion more of like well this is my job you know right. what I mean so yeah and like I think to me it, all the crypto stuff and I haven't dove into it super deeply but it's also piqued my interest and there's a lot of um like uh, three Lau or Blau, I think it's three Lau. Like he's big into it. And I was reading a couple things he wrote about it. And to me, it's like a further democratization and decentralization. That is kind of like the next step of royalties, because right now, how often do we hear in the music industry? Like artists are like, Oh, well the only way to make money consistently is to tour. And I just, you just got to keep touring. And it's like, that's not necessarily true though, because like, the way that royalties work, like that is actually the closest thing to a stable, consistent income is your actual intellectual property that people are listening to. You know, obviously you can get stuff synced. And then like, if your song is like on a commercial, that's like amazing and you can get money from that. But I think this is kind of like an evolution up from that and creating some more stability for people so that this career path is not seen as so unrealistic or unstable because the irony of it is that I would say that as musicians, as artists, when you create a piece of music that people love, like you're creating an incredibly valuable piece of intellectual property that has no ceiling on how often it can be consumed. So paradoxically, that should be one of the most valuable assets. And the fact that it's not an economically lucrative thing for artists or hasn't been up until this point is, uh, I think, a testament to just the way that the industry has worked up until this point. 
And I think first the internet changed that where like, it's just easier to be an artist. Like you, there's just no gatekeepers. Now you can literally just be independent. And now like, you know, companies like what you started, I think are like the next step of that. So pivoting off of that, I want to bring it back to you. <laughs> so one thing I, I said this in the intro, but one thing I really respect about you is that I feel like you're, and maybe this is, I'm sure this is like a projection, but I, I just feel like every time I see what you're up to, you're, you're always up to like a million different things. You always got your hand in a lot of things, which in and of itself, I respect a lot because I feel like you are able to manage a lot of different things. But I feel like you're always thinking about things in a way that's bigger than just you. You know, it's not to say that, and we were talking about this offline before, where you're like, well, I'm not like a monk, you know, like I, I do care about like my own gain as well, like all humans do. But I feel like it seems like you tend to really be drawn towards things that create value for a community of people. I'm curious, like if you, I mean, I don't know how much like reflection you've done on that quality within yourself, but where do you think that comes from? Or like, is that something that you have like cultivated over time or is it just, do you think it's just like kind of how you're wired or like, where does that come from? Cause I don't think, and we were also talking about this, not everybody's like that. For sure not, especially not in the music industry. Well, if we're in the therapist chair, I would say it comes from my mom. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she, I mean, I'm serious. She's like such an incredibly empathetic and amazing woman and overly empathetic sometimes, you know? You come home and, you know, it's like, can I get you anything? Like, do you want this? Are you sure? You know, like, right. and it's like that, you know, times 10 for anybody that walks through uh, my parents' house. But no, I mean, I think I really believe in trial and error and anytime I like carefully choose people that I want to surround myself with and make sure that those people like they don't have to be the most talented people off the rip you know it's just do they have the propensity for collaboration and growth and you know and and a good spirit a positive mindset and if people have that you're putting yourself in the best direction for success regardless of what it is you know what i mean a, a relationship on a romantic level a friendship a business relationship like all that stuff so yeah so i mean i think that that's all part of it i think it's all where does it come from is just i've tried doing certain things on my own and you know you get to a certain point that's like really great but I don't know. Maybe it's also like I'm an only child, too. So it's like I just want to like I didn't have brothers and sisters to like share stuff with as I was growing up. And so it's really cool to see everybody just kind of come together and have a good time. And like, you know, yeah, it's just I haven't really broken it down like that, you know, but I think welcome it, to my podcast. <laughs> welcome to your podcast. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think it's just why not? You know what I mean? Like, if you think about it from like a very realistic standpoint, you know, if I were to be super selfish in everything that I did and being selfish is not a bad thing. Also, that's a super common misconception that people think that being selfish is a negative thing. You know, you have to be selfish in life in certain aspects, but you also have to be a little selfless in certain ways and gauging when and where to, to be one or the other is like the art of growing up, I guess, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And I even think like, you know, and I mean, I'm just drawing on my own spiritual path and spiritual experiences that I've had through meditation and plant medicine and things like that. Like, I even think that the dichotomy between being selfish and being selfless and like being concerned about others versus yourself is in and of itself illusory in the sense that it presupposes the concept that we are even separate from each other. And I think like, I mean, we were talking about this before we started recording outside, but you were asking me about my recent adventure to the Amazon, where I was doing this plant medicine called Huachuma. It's a psychedelic cactus. And one of the most profound experiences that I had was just feeling, I felt so connected to everything around me. And like, I was in nature and like, I didn't have Instagram. It was just there was no reminders anywhere that I looked to remind me of my my identity or my individual self or ego, which in my daily life, the reminders are everywhere. Like all I have to do is log on to Instagram and just like get my daily dose of validation for this character that I've like created. 
you know, that like everybody, you know, is giving me validation for. I would even say the opposite of like feeling bad or having like uh, self doubt is like equally narcissistic. It's like still just all about you, you know? And when I was out there, I felt so connected to everything around me and to the people around me, which sounds like a cliche, but it wasn't like a conceptual experience. It was a visceral, like felt experience. And that sense of connection completely dwarfed any sense of self-importance that I could have possibly had. Like, of course, like I'm a human being, I'm not like a Buddhist saint. So like, obviously like I have an ego and I don't think it's, I think the spiritual teaching to like kill your ego is not necessarily right in the sense that like, I just think it's unrealistic and like we're human beings, like we're here to be human beings, you know, <laughs> like, so totally, it's totally fine to have an ego. But one of the big insights that I had, which I'm really trying to integrate in and which I feel like you really embody and live is yes, it's good to like do things for yourself. But once you can dismantle that sense of separation, something that you've told me many times over the years is like, if one of us wins, like if one of us like makes it or whatever, we all make it because we're all sharing in that person's success. And even from the most selfish, manipulative Machiavellian, like if you just have like no morals at all, that still is the best strategy because like, if your friend makes it like they'll, you'll get that wealth. Like, you know, if you just like completely stripped your, any sense of like being happy for them from it, it's still better to collaborate with people. And, um, yeah, it's, I think one of the, another reason that I kind of admired is I know for myself, I think artists in general, like when the product that you're working on is like your art and it's like coming from you, it can feel so personal. And so important because it's like your baby like it's not like like we're not selling like you know widgets we're like creating something that like came from a place of inspiration or maybe some deep emotional thing i think there is like a self-righteousness that is easy to fall into it's like very tempting to fall into as an artist and just be like no this has to be me and like you said it's good to have a healthy amount of that otherwise like you can very easily get taken advantage of because you can sure, like, you know, for sure that other people in the industry have that. So like, you got to be able to look out for it. But I just feel like one of the biggest insight that I've had lately is like, whenever I start making things about me, that's always like the root of like my suffering. <laughs> like it's always, it always like leads to me getting way too tense and like way too precious about things as opposed to just getting in the studio and being like, let's just like see what the muse delivers today and just like have a good time. Yeah, I mean, well, we're, you know, to that point, working in a studio environment day in and day out. And when I first started the studio, I was in here, I would say 75% of the time that I was awake. And I was working with different clients and things like that. And I learned so much so quickly because it really was trial by fire. And when we first started, I didn't really have like, the capital to like just hire somebody to take on a session so like I took on every single session that I possibly could and that was great because it was the best possible way of removing the personal side of making music so you're like making it for somebody else and you want the best for them too like you don't want to look like a bad producer or bad engineer whatever it might be so you're doing your absolute best, but at the end of the day, they're guiding you because it's their project. So you're contributing, you're a major contributor without being both the artist and the contributor, if that makes sense. Totally. So it's been really actually helpful to, to have that experience. And honestly, that's, I would say my biggest growth as a producer has come from those relationships where I'm writing for somebody else and it's not my own track, but I, you know, I want it to be of a certain like quality and a certain songwriting that, you know, I can be proud of, but yeah, you like remove that ego element or that projection of like, I need this to be, cause everybody's had that moment where you like hear a track and you're like, Ooh, damn, that is fire. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're like, I want that. I want that for somebody else. I want that for me, but I also want that for the people listening to it. And if I don't achieve that when I'm making the music, then yeah. I haven't achieved it it becomes more about the craft and less about, and I'm not saying this can't happen when you're making your own stuff for your own project. I just think there, like you said, there is that added challenge of like, there's this existential 
weird need for it to be like super unique and personal and like totally capture who you are as a person, which is a fool's errand because like, you're just not like, I mean, we're just not a static thing. We're just like a process that's like constantly unfolding. Right. Whereas when it's another person's product, they're also not a static thing to themselves. But to me, that person is an object in the sense of like, they're a person who's like not me so it's like i have a perception of them and them as an artist and them as a project and then like my job as a producer is just to bring that out and i can fully focus my effort on making it like giving people that feeling where they're like damn like, this is fucking crazy as opposed to like needing it to capture some like ineffable quality about myself because i think i'm like so special which is great. Now that brings it full circle to, you know, why do I believe in collaboration? And it's probably partially because of that, you know, right. someone else's perspective, their projection on what they think you are, how they see your brand, how they see your sound, whatever it might be, that helps you see your sound. You know, when you can, when you have like a bit of a mirror and you're able to see your reflection, it's like easier to understand like, oh, like I, you know, like when I, when I, I earlier i made i played a few of my recent tracks for you and you were like yeah these are going across a few different vibes but i can hear you know what connects them through your thing and i'm like I'm like yeah okay like that's right you know but like i'm not right. thinking of it that way but like yeah you saying that i'll probably sit down and you know listen to them or when i'm you know running at the gym i'll like listen to them and i'll be like what was he talking about right yeah yeah <laughs> Totally, like, man. think about like, it a little bit. So, yeah, but that helps. That really helps to yeah. shape who you are, you know, so or shape how you see yourself or what you feel comfortable with. Right. And I could never describe what I mean by that in words. Like I tried. It was like I was like, it's something about the groove. Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> I mean, yeah. OK, like Eric Pritz has his like snare or whatever. But like the whole point is that it's not describable by something simple. You know, this is why, like. And I know I'm not alone in this. Like, I hate the question, what kind of music do you make? Like, I'm just like, listen to it and I like, come up with your own. Because I have a, an answer that I would give where it's like, oh, it's like Major Lazer, but Indian, like, or whatever. <laughs> or I use like a flute a lot of the time. So now sometimes people just send me songs, other people's songs with a flute. And they're like, oh, it sounds like you. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It just has a flute in it. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like me at all. The old pan pipe. Yeah, the old like pan flute or whatever, or like the Bansuri, like Indian flute. And uh, I think that's the beautiful thing about being an artist. It's like we said earlier, it is the challenge, but also once you can just surrender that you'll never fully have your finger on what that thing is because it's changing. It's like trying to catch a wind or something. Like it's just that your personality is changing as you grow. So your music's also changing. But to bring it back to the production thing, yeah, man, I actually resisted that for a long time because I was, to be honest, like so precious. And I was like, ah, no, like I didn't want my identity to be like a producer. I was like, it was just narcissistic. I was like, I need to be like an artist. So I actually turned down a lot of production requests for many years. And I like just people would hit me up and be like, oh, I really like this, your sound. Like, can you help me make something? And I was like, no, like everything I make needs to be for me. And it was like, recently I've started working more and more with people and it is like very liberating because it's just like, yeah, you just remove the me from it. And what I've realized is that ultimately what I'm looking for when I make music, when I listen to music and pretty much like what guides every decision that I make in my life is like more freedom. Everything I do is like just designed to get more freedom. I mean, that's why I quit my like nine to five job. I was just like, I can't have my time controlled by like something, someone or something else. And I think that's why people want money. It's just like, it's not the money that is necessarily in and of itself valuable. Like money is just a concept that we all agree on, but it's the freedom that it gives you, like the freedom to go travel or do, do whatever you want. And I realized that with music too, like the reason I love music so much is because I can put on a song and I've tried like a lot of different shit like spiritual practices and like psychedelics like I've, i'll try anything like i'm down for whatever but like to this day nothing nothing can modulate my my mood or get me out of my head as quickly as music it's just like the ultimate release and i realize that that's why i make music too and by making it all about me i'm actually like subverting that freedom 
because I'm now I'm like attached to this identity. It's a really interesting process that I think a lot of artists deal with. Yeah, I mean, for sure. It's something that I think whenever you're making, whenever you start making music, you. I was actually thinking about this the other day because I was playing my girlfriend some tracks, like the first track that I made when I was like, oh, dude, I'm going to make it. And it was like the first track I ever made. That right. was like, yeah, like you know, a the decent mix number. or whatever. And then, you know, like, whatever, like eight years ago, seven years ago. Right. And I was like, this is the one, right. baby. All right. And, uh, you know, I was going through like old SoundCloud stuff. And it was so interesting because I was like listening to it. And I was like, wow, this still sounds like me. It's just like a a less mature version of, of me. But at the same time, it's important to create a reference for where your journey sort of you know began or where like there are certain tracks I don't know if this is the same for you but there are certain tracks in my catalog that I'll like listen back to and I'll be like this was a defining track you know like maybe it didn't go anywhere or whatever but like this was a defining track because it pushed me further or created a reference point for me in my like greater journey you know what I mean totally I think those things are are really cool because they they really do provide the context that you need to understand something about yourself at that point in time but like reflecting on it is really cool cuz you're like you know maybe in the moment or like 6 months down the road you've heard that song so many times you know right, right. and you're like god this is like such shit it's a shit <laughs> song you know what i mean you're like right. what was i thinking you know but then you listen to it like seven years later and you're you're not really thinking about it in the same way you're thinking about it from a more mature standpoint as a producer and you're like wow like this was something you know what i mean <laughs> right. like it was it was okay it was like what was i getting so hard on myself for like right because yeah. i didn't eq the snare properly like you know whatever oh that's um, so true but that's you know that's that's from a production standpoint but from a from a career standpoint it's also cool to see like what opened up a door for me you know metaphorically speaking and gave me the courage to pursue something new or or drive it forward you know what i mean yeah do you feel like that way about moments or conversations with people as well yeah because I, this just actually occurred to me you told me something that totally changed my approach to writing melodies really once years ago because well and what's funny is that Maybe it's just because I'm so uh, like introspective and just constantly like analyzing myself. But like, so a long time ago, I was playing you some stuff, and at the time, I wasn't as into like house and techno. Which this is a huge generalization, but generally is not as like melody driven as like pop. And I was like, you know, listening to a lot of like Major Lazer and stuff, and I just like didn't listen to that kind of music. And you were listening to a lot, and. I remember you saying like, you know, with melodies, you want them to be like short and like repetitive and not like too complicated or like too like indulgent, basically. And it was in the context of like, I was probably showing you like an incredibly indulgent melody. And, um, and I remember at first I was like super triggered and I was like, fucks, like fuck Spencer. Like what do you like? He doesn't make this kind of music, like, <laughs> like whatever. But then like I thought about it and then I started listening to songs and I was like, oh yeah, that's actually kind of true people don't care how dope my melody is. They just care if it like makes them feel something and that's what I should focus on. And so that really actually changed. Like that was just a conversation that changed my production. And actually I think about that when I produce sometimes, like when I'm making melodies and since then now I've had moments where I've thought about it and then either like it's changed the melody that I'm writing or I've consciously thought about it and chose to like disobey that advice in the moment and just be like, no, I'm going to be indulgent knowing full well what the implications are. And that's going back to like what you're talking about, about listening to old stuff. Dude, I think, and maybe this is what you were kind of alluding to, like when I listen to old stuff, I feel this like compassion for my younger self. It's like a self-love exercise where I'm just like, oh, that's so cute. Like, you know, he was like the same exact thing. I, I was trying to sound like a, Hardwell at the time. And I made this like. I haven't heard any of this music. I'll play it for you later. Like, <laughs> I, I made this song called Joystick. And. Um, Sounds like we, a hit. It was, it was a smash, dude. Like, actually, like, 
it's pretty fire. Like it's it was a total rip of Spaceman by Hardwell. It was like the ex- complete rip, and the obviously the production quality was like terrible. But well, not terrible. It just wasn't as what it is now. But like when I listen to it, I can hear the purity and just like the fun that I was having, you know, in the music. And I lost that for a while. Or I think it's just you can lose that when it becomes your career or you start to try to like have a result or you start trying to try to make music for this label or that label. And that's kind of why I started my own label, which I'm now publicly announcing, but like, which I haven't released anything on yet, but it's literally just cause I'm just like, I want to never lose that playfulness again. Like I lost it. And I realized largely from listening to old stuff of mine, I was like, damn, he didn't know what the fuck he was doing. Like production wise, but at least he was just like out here, like trying to make weird sounds and having a good time. And maybe it didn't go anywhere. And now it's like, now that I have the skills, the production skills, bringing that back. And it's like this full circle. It's like a hero's journey, like coming back home, but you're like more comfortable now. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a lot of feeling like you have to, it's not like feeling like you have to be cool. It's just like, you want to be cool as a musician. And, like, that's the thing about being cool is that you can't, like, force being cool. You just either are or you are. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, like, I don't know. I'm a big fan of just listening to uh, and appreciating, like, good music regardless of the genre. And, like, I know you're the same way. You, like, love good music regardless of what it is. And you'll make good music regardless of, like, what it is. And, and that's, I think, really important. Keeping that youthfulness or that playfulness in the in the music is i think coming full circle in your artist career i also believe that it's not important for like there's some guys like i don't even know how old john summit is but like guys like john summit who are like they definitely know like what they're doing and they have their sound and and it is cool and but they maybe just like kind of like came into that like they watched a couple youtube videos they didn't overthink it and they just sort of like you know, totally. Whereas like, you know, I've been producing music for, I don't know, like probably eight years or something. And like, I'm not Diplo yet. You know what I mean? But I think there's also a good, it's like not a, not a race. And it's like important to just like have that journey. If like, it means having that full journey to appreciate like the type of music you're making and understand like why you're there and how you're there, then I think that's totally fine. The guys that are like Madeon or whatever, Madian, whatever, however you pronounce his name, he was like 16 and he was making 70 grand a show and was just, you know, huge, right? What does he know about? He might have gone, never released anything and like gone through this journey and then been like the next, you know, Solomon and made a totally different genre. You know what I mean? Like, just like, basically you know techno or whatever you know like whatever it is right melodic techno who knows what the guy would have made but because like Madion was like a brand at 16 that's like what he's stuck with you know what i mean i don't know if you had what was the name of the song you gotta be more specific <laughs> swirly guns the the hardwell song oh joystick joystick swirly guns, swirly guns whatever <laughs> you know <laughs> That's a pretty accurate it's, description. It's the dub version of it. Right. Swirly, swirly guns, guns mix. Swirly guns dub. Late night swirly guns edit. Later sunrise edit. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you had, like, released that, and all of a sudden you had, like, CAA knocking on your door, and they were like, we're putting you on tour right now. You're, right. you're the next Hardwell, like, blah, blah, blah. And you became this, like, big EDM guy in that sound, and your brand was built off of that, and you're still making music that way, but you were like, but I really want to make like shishi music. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what yeah. I really wanted. You know, like, then was that the right choice? I mean, yeah, you'd be making mega bucks, but like, you know, you then pigeonholed yourself into like who you are and Dude. what your brand is. So it's like yeah. all the, I think the, pro, you know, the journey is like, it's, I don't want to say like predestined, but you know, there's a reason that we find reluctance in, you know, releasing certain music or going down a certain path. You know, it's not just because of our own insecurities as producers or something. It's like, there's something else there. I think. I feel like life or being an artist, AKA life is combination of intention and surrender. And you can't 
just go super hard on one or the other, or you're going to, in my experience, when I go too hard on the intention, I'm like, I'm going to make this happen. Like I just burn out every time. And then when I go too hard on the surrender, like nothing happens. <laughs> so it's this mix. And what you said about, yeah, it's a conversation. Like you have to be talking, but you also have to be like listening to like what is wanting to come through you and what, what is wanting to come out. Like it reminds me of uh, Keith Richards has this incredible quote where he said that every great song has already been written and they're all just floating around above us in the air. And the people who are great artists are the ones who can open themselves up enough to pay attention and then just like pluck a song out of the air. And I think he was like, somebody was asking him how he came up with the riff for one of the songs, Rolling Stones songs. And that was his answer. He was like, I didn't come up with it. Like it was already written. I just like plucked it out of the air because I was, I happened to be the guy who was at the right place listening it's such an epic quote. And even to bring back to what you're talking about with these potential different futures, like I think RIP Avicii, like that was like my, I mean, that was like the reason I got into him and Skrill X were like the reason I started listening to electronic music. And I remember he was a year older than me and he blew up when he was super young, obviously. And I actually met him in LA once like years and years ago just for like a few minutes. And I remember like after meeting him, I was just, I remember like feeling kind of down. Cause I was like, even though he started producing when he was like so young and I hadn't even like started producing yet, but I was like, damn, like he's like already so famous. And like, what am I doing in my life and all this stuff with total respect, like rest in peace. Like he's like dead now. Like, it's like, that's an extreme example, but it's like, nobody gets through life without experiencing the full range <laughs> of human emotions. Like, you can be sure that you're going to like get your heart broken. You're going to feel like ecstatic joy, like fall in love, feel disappointed, feel regret. Like everybody feels all of it. It's not like some people are absolved from that because they like reach their dreams at a certain age. Even like Maddie and I remember, cause at my old job, I worked with him on some product stuff and I was hanging out with him in LA. And this was after he had just gotten back from his tour with Porter Robinson and he was like super down actually at the time. Like he was basically like he was trying to write, finish his album, which ended up coming out and being like number one on billboard and stuff. But at the time he was super down and he was like, not like in a great place. And he was open to me about it. He was just like, yeah, like, I just don't know. Like I'm feeling all this like doubt. And I was like, dude, you're fucking mad. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? But I think that's super helpful for any artist listening to know that yeah. we're all are going to feel all of it. So to try to do anything as a strategy to like avoid feeling something is like ultimately going to fail. So it's like, there has to be another reason that you're doing it, you know? Totally. And, you know, also as a strategy for something very specific is also a strategy for failure, like wanting mm -hmm. fame or success in a certain type of light, having that like expectation for something. Cause yeah, I mean like on a, different level a lot of the great things that have happened in my life outside of music or in music have just been you know happenstance and really have come out of love as opposed to strategy completely and I can say that firmly you know I just feel uh like I'm, I met Erica I met my girlfriend when I was in a you know DJ booth and she like came to this show I was like touring in Europe and then I like came back and it was the first show that I was playing in Brooklyn after being on tour for two months and then she was like coming from some work event in Boston and she like came back and decided to go to this show and like that's how we met and I was doing I wasn't like looking for love I was you know in love with music and I was doing what I loved you know what I mean so I think it's important to like put love as the focus of what you're doing and all the other great things will kind of like come, will orbit around that. You know what I mean? It's like just, I think as a general rule of thumb, that's how it works, you know? Totally. So, yeah, I mean, like you said, you were embodying the thing that she probably ultimately brought to your life, which was like more love. It reminds me of a quote, like, you don't get what you want, you get what you already are. That's a huge perspective change. So perfect example of what you said is like, 
for a long time, and this is still a goal of mine, but for a long time, my orientation towards it was like, I want to play Sahara stage at Coachella. And like, the reason I set that goal was because I went to Sahara stage at Coachella and I saw like Troy boy and like San Holo playing there. And I was like, this is fucking amazing. Like, this is like exactly, this is like my dream. Like, this is what I want. And I was like, okay, like if I can do that, then like, I'll know I've made it. And it's like very quickly, it got warped into this like results oriented thing where I was like, everything I do, all the decisions I make were like, if it doesn't help me play Sahara stage at Coachella, then like, I'm not interested. And at the time I thought that was good because I thought it was giving me clarity. And I was like, okay, I can say no to all these other things because they're not helping me like get this one singular thing. And then I was having a conversation with my friend and he was like, okay, so like, imagine you play it, you do it. Then what are you going to (laughs) do? And I was like, oh yeah, right. And then I realized like, well, the reason I had that goal in the first place is because I think it's going to deliver certain things to me. I think it's going to deliver a sense of like validation and being appreciated for my work and a peak experience. So how can I today, having not had that experience, give myself those things? It doesn't mean let go of the goal, but it just changed my orientation to it where it's like, that's still a goal of mine. But the reason that it's a good goal is not because it's going to be so awesome when it happens anymore. The reason it's a good goal is because in order for me to achieve that goal, the steps that I would need to take day to day are things that I really enjoy doing. Yeah, pers- yeah, perspective. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's incredible. I think that perspective is so powerful. And that's something that you've taught me too. Like when we went to Ibiza together that one summer, it was like, great. I was just like in a weird funk. I was in a bad place. And it was right before I did the tour. And... Yeah, we just like did life stuff, you know, like just like, you know, doing like life stuff. It wasn't anything like specific or this or that. And through that, I remember we really just had a great time and there was no pressure. And my perspective on where I was in life or like what I was feeling had changed and nothing really had changed, like nothing other than my perspective, you know what I mean? Like everything else was the same. Like my financial standing was the same. My business standing was the same. Everything was the same. It was just the perspective that I had on life at the time. You know what I mean? So, and that was like a lot of like meditation and like that's where we met or hung out with like VJ, which was great. VJ Gibson. Yeah, VJ Gibson. (laughs) Yeah, he's great. I had a call with him recently. He's working at a really cool company now. Nice. But yeah, it's definitely perspective is such a huge thing on it. So I, I have a question for you, actually. Shoot. Other than just this being like an entertaining podcast, like what are the things that you want people to sort of, or you hope that people take away from, you know, these podcasts? Like, why are you putting them out there? Yeah, I have a very clear answer to that, but I'll preface it first by quickly just saying that, like, we should just date this answer to like this date and time, because like, I just have learned about myself that like everything is just constantly changing. So maybe my intention for this podcast will, and for sure it will grow and evolve and change. But I think at the core of it, I started this podcast for the same reason that I started making music, which is that I started making music because I enjoyed it, but also because music, consuming music was so beneficial to my life. And so I was like, if I can produce the same thing that I'm consuming that's beneficial to my life and have benefit on others' lives, then that seems like a good use of time. Like It just seems like I'm not like wasting my life by doing that. And also, I really enjoy doing it. So almost in the exact same way, I listen to a lot of podcasts, but only like a handful. There's like a few podcasts that I listen to, but I like love them and they really, really benefit my life. They really give me perspective. I was listening to one on the way here. Aubrey Marcus podcast is like my favorite podcast. And like, I literally literally listen to every episode and it's like the guests that they have and the way that the podcast flows, which is very much kind of what I'm like emulating in this podcast, which is like less of like an interview because I'm talking to a lot of artists. So it's not like, I don't want it to be like, when did you like, like that kind of vibe. I want it to just be like an organic conversation. But that podcast and just in general, like wisdom from people that I look up to and people that I admire has helped me so much in my life, just get perspective. And if I can do that for other people, 
then this seems like a good use of time. And then also similar to music, I just like talking about deep shit. So it's like, I just genuinely like enjoy doing that. I'm aware that like, I like the sound of my own voice, maybe a little too much. And I like also hearing what people that I respect have to say and absorbing that like a sponge. And, um, I mean, you know me, like I just, it's impossible for me to like not have it make a conversation deep. And I've had so many conversations with friends where we just stop in the middle and we're like, man, like people would really like benefit from like, we should like turn this into a podcast, which maybe sounds kind of cocky, but like, I really do believe that. Like, I just think that that's like a skill, I guess, or or something that I've been like blessed with. So no, for sure. I mean, if, if somebody has a good takeaway from it, that's, you know, probably the same or a similar reason. Yeah. Like you said, to why you make music, how many tracks have like changed your mood, you know? And it's all just like these slight, like minute shifts in people's behavior that kind of like affect the macro, you know, like if there's good stuff happening, it's like a ripple effect, you know? And yeah, if I'm like in a bad mood and I'm just being short with somebody, then it doesn't put someone else in a good mood. You know, it puts them probably in a, in a bad mood and they probably pass that along and so on and so forth. So the more that you can um, positively, send like that good energy throughout the ripple then you know it's good so i mean it's good to hear that you're that you're doing this i like it it's a cool thing for sure thanks man yeah it's uh reminds me i'm about to completely butcher this quote i think it's like a buddhist i have no idea i'm gonna have to look this up and put it in the show notes because i'm not gonna say it correctly right now but something along the lines of uh is like when i was young and stupid i tried to like okay, like I I looked out at the world. I'm already butchering this. <laughs> I looked I looked out of the world and like saw how fucked up the world was. That's not the quote. It's something along those lines. And then it's like when I was young and stupid, I tried to change others. Then when that didn't work, I tried to change the world. Then when that didn't work, I realized that all I could change was myself. And it's like I just think that that's um yeah, that's a really powerful quote and. Uh, yeah, it's funny how when you create a piece of content, whether it's like a long form conversation like this or even like a song or whatever, put it once you put it out there, like it just has a life of its own. And now that piece of content is going to have a relationship with whoever comes across it that they don't even know you. So they don't even have a relationship with you, but they're going to have a relationship with that song or this podcast or whatever it is, you know, and um, or even all the things you're working on, like your business and stuff. And then those relationships are going to positively affect those people's lives. And I think that's a way to be in a lot of places at once in an interesting way. So totally a hundred percent. It's cool. Yeah. I like it. I think it's a great concept for a podcast and I'm really uh, grateful that you put me on and um, you know, maybe uh, as the podcast grows, you know, later on down the road, we'll, we'll chat again on where we've been since today. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely do a part two. Anything else before we wrap up that the people should know? No. I mean, just everyone have a good day and, you know, be positive. Nice. All right. Oh, I do have a final question, which I ask all of my guests. Okay. Except for the second one, because I forgot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what makes you feel most free? What makes me feel most free? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Probably, that's a really difficult question. That's a tough one. What did all the other guests say? (laughs) (laughs) They told me they wanted to wait for your answer. (laughs) I would say probably my gut reaction, what makes me feel most free is completely being immersed in a specific moment and capturing that like a screen grab and using that as a reference point. As an example, when I was a kid, I went away on vacation to this really like snowy place with my family. And I don't know why, but it just brought me so much comfort. And so I reference that over and over again. I think about that when I'm like stressed out or something. I just like gravitate towards that like one moment. It was nothing in particular. It was just snow in the woods in this like place. So 
I'm a nostalgic person too. So probably like what makes me feel most free is like being like living in the moment and finding those, those or reliving those moments, like in my replaying those moments. Mm. Nice. Yeah. I love that. What about you? Has anyone asked you the question? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's supposed to be my question that I asked the guest. Well, I'm supposed to not have to think about it. What makes you feel most free? I think for me, it's just very simply, it's when the separation between me and the other, whether the other is another person or something I'm working on or nature or whatever it is, when the separation between the experiencer and the experienced dissolves and there's just a union. I mean, like, you know, tangible examples of that are like getting in a flow state in music, having really amazing sex with someone being in nature, which may have something to do with the snow story you were talking about, where you're just like, you just ha- are like, wow, this is so much bigger than me. And I'm just like a part of this, you know? And like, it couldn't care less about like me as an individual, but it's also nurturing me like so well. So yeah, I would say like when the illusion of separation dissolves is when I feel most free. That's a very great answer. Thank you. You had lots of time to think about that. Come on. <laughs> the whole time I was like, He's going to ask me. I'll come up with something. Yeah. Well, anyway, this is uh, Spencer Zabila, a.k.a. Artwork, signing off. Nice. Yeah, I'll put all your links and such in the, uh, your like 18 businesses that you're 18 running businesses. right now. Yeah, yeah. In the show notes. Yeah, dude, thanks for coming on. I love you. And we're now we're just going to go make some fire tech house, probably. Probably. All right, guys. Peace.